So, thank you very much for inviting me to Brazil again. Uh, I just finished a two-day class in, uh, in, uh, here in Sao Paulo with these fantastic friends and business partners, Alexandre, Manuel and André. It was the first time we did a course with four facilitators. We almost had more facilitators than, than students in the room. No, just kidding. There were 30 people. It was a, was a big class. Fortunately, all of them were called Victor. They only invited people who were called Victor. That was made it very easy for me. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a good class. But I show you this picture because for me, this is the way we work together is an example of, of how I want to work in the 21st century. We are like a tribal business, and I will, I'm going to talk about that, this, uh, this keynote. Actually, I have five topics, work, happiness, success, management, and, and organization. And we're going to look at each of, those, uh, each of those topics. So, let's talk about work. Here's my first question. Why do we work? Why do people work? There, there are different answers to that, uh, to that question. Um, there's a famous model called the hierarchy of needs. Probably some of you have seen it before, the Maslow hierarchy of needs. It says that it starts with food. Many people have to work, otherwise they can't eat. So that's the first level. Uh, health is the second level. Uh, uh, friends, some people work so that they work on their social relationships. Or even higher, they work on their, on their respect. Work gives them and gains them respect in, in society. But ultimately, the model says, uh, the highest level is self-actualization, the living towards a purpose. And that I find very interesting. Now, there is an uh, implied idea that this is a hierarchy and that we should travel upwards in this, in this hierarchy, but we shouldn't take it too serious. The scientists say it is, it is a bit, it's a bit uh, uh, nonsense that this is a hierarchy. Every, we, we do everything at the same time, basically. The, uh, eating food and working on self-actualization. But I think it is a nice model. And uh, there's this famous guru, uh, Gary Hamill. He wrote his book, What Matters Now. And he said, only one in five people are truly engaged in their work. Only one in five people are really happy while, while working in their, in their jobs. I think that's sad. And there's another uh, uh, interesting uh, guru, Jonathan Haidt. Uh, he wrote about happiness, and he said, uh, most people have uh, one of three approaches to work. They see it as a job, or as a career, or as a calling. And when I read that, I thought, hmm, that's interesting. It seems that we can map that to the hierarchy of needs. Because you see, for people who see work as giving them food or health, for those people, work is a job. And for the people who work because it gains them friends and respect, for those people, work is a career. But the highest one, for those people who, seek, who, who uh, seek self actualization, for them, work is a calling. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Those, those models seem to map nicely uh, onto each other. And there's this famous word, this famous term called work-life balance that, that, that people have been talking about for the last 10 years that says that we should balance work and life. Um, but I find that a bit strange. Uh, uh, I, I aim at self-actualization. I believe for the people who, who work because it fulfills their purpose, for them, work is life. I enjoy being on stage. This is part of my work, but it's also self-actualization. I'm not dead at this time. It is not that I live when I'm, when I'm not working. The, this work-life this work balance is a bit strange. Like either you're working or either you're living. That's a bit, that's a bit weird. So uh, I'm, I'm quite alive at this time, fortunately. And you know this guy probably, right? He's very famous in, in Brazil, Ricardo Semler. Yeah, I loved his, uh, I loved his books. And he said this, this popular concept of work-life balance, it is not at all what we want at Semco. We want work-life integration. Work should be part of, of, of life. And I truly, I truly believe that as well. So this work-life thing, where it, where it is work versus life, I, I don't really believe in that. I don't really believe in that. There's another question. Why do we work together? Why is it that I do work and you do work and, and we have this relationship, working relationship with each other? Well, there's a model for that as well. 
the first uh, part is, this is called tribal leadership. The first level says, life sucks. Life sucks. This was me when I, uh, when I, uh, uh, when I was in, in, in high school, when I was 14 years old. I, I hated, I hated my life. It was, uh, it was terrible at school. I, 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 I saw that, uh, uh, that everyone, everyone else was having sex except me. And so that this is, this is, this, life sucks. And then I noticed, hmm, uh, maybe if everyone else is having sex except me, then it's just, just my life that sucks. It's very not their life that sucks, right? So I climbed one level upwards. But then I, I, I became a student and the stu and, and, uh, at the university in Delft, and, and suddenly things turned around. I, suddenly I was the popular guy, unless, uh, not so in high school, but in, in, in the university I was. And then it was, oh, I'm great, everyone wants to work with me. They all invited me for committees and the student society. So, oh, I'm great. And then when I learned how to work with other people and, and learned that we can do things together, then this turned into, we are great together as, uh, as uh, uh, organizations. And ultimately, the, the model says, the top is, life is great. So again, this is five levels. I don't know why all these models have five levels, but it is nice. It's always five. Five is a lucky number, I suppose. So, and again, there is this idea of moving upwards. And again, you shouldn't take it too serious, but it is a nice model. I find it useful. And again, I think we can map this job, career, calling idea to this model. For those people who have a job, they usually say their job sucks. And those who have a career, they think, oh, I'm great, <laughs> or we are great. But those who see life as a calling, they'll say, they'll say life is great. James Parker is a former CEO of a famous, uh, famous uh, 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 Northern American airline, uh, Southwest Airlines. You may have heard of them. They're the only airline that has been profitable for 40 years. They never, never had a loss. Even when the times were bad after 9-11, uh, many years ago, the whole industry suffered, but Southwest was still barely able to have a profit. So they do very well. And they say, for them, everything is about the people. The people working for the airline, they need to have a great job. And they're famous for that. And they say, our, our job is it's, it's like a mission. We, people should go home and look into the mirror and say, we did something great today. As, as an airline, and I agree with that. Richard Branson, famous of uh, Virgin, uh, for, for the Virgin companies, he said something uh, similar. He said, this is not about making profits as a business. Of course we need profits. Of course we need pro to be profitable. But we have to make the world a better place, using those profits to help life uh, in, in general because we recognize that life is great, and not just we are great. So, I see businesses as communities. I have this, uh, this, this uh, uh, page here that describes that a community is a body of, of persons uh, with professional interests scattered throughout a larger society. This is exactly how I see businesses. They are, they are communities of people working together towards a, uh, towards a purpose. So I visualize it here uh, with, um, uh, with this little picture. Oh, and by the way, just to prove that anyone can draw, I just uh, spoke about it with, with you, anyone can draw. I, I, I have drawn all these pictures in this presentation with my left hand. I am right-handed. I, I draw them with my left hand and they look, they look actually horrible, but still. It is, it, is, it is a nice picture. So this is proof to, for, from me to you that anyone can draw. So this is a tribe or a community, uh, and, and we could see this also as a, as a business, people working together. Another great example is uh, Patagonia. Maybe some of you know them as the company that sells uh, uh, shirts and jackets and, and all kinds of clothes for people uh, who, uh, who love outdoor, uh, 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 outdoor recreation. And they say, they see their business as an ecosystem, an ecosystem of people working together towards a purpose. Both the vendors and the customers are also part of that ecosystem. They are part of that whole, of that whole system. 
John Mackey is the famous uh, guru of, of the famous CEO of, uh, of Whole Foods Market, one of the best supermarkets in the US. I love Whole Foods Market. Been there several times. And, uh, and again, they have a similar purpose. They say, uh, our business is like a magnet that attracts the right people. Team members, customers, and suppliers, uh, and, uh, and everyone else, and aligns them towards a common purpose. And for them, the purpose is uh, healthier living and, and, and happier people. He calls it conscious capitalism. So, all these are examples of, 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 of gurus and CEOs who, who have more modern ways of thinking about the organization. And, and this, is, this is a picture of the organization. Uh, they, are, they are people working together, and we call them all stakeholders. So my first conclusion when we talk about the questions, what is work and why do we work together? My conclusion is ideally, I see them as communities of stakeholders with a common purpose. That is what a business is for me. It is working, people working together because they have a purpose and I call them community. I love that metaphor, seeing businesses as communities. Now let's talk about organizations. Here's the first question. What is an organization? What, what defines an organization? I had to look it up in the dictionary. Um, uh, the dictionary said it is an administrative and functional structure the, or the people of such a structure. So apparently this is, this is a structural thing. When, when, when a community has a, a certain structure, then we tend to call it an, an, an organization. And usually, when I, when I ask people, can you draw the structure of your business, then this is what they do. Right? They draw a hierarchy. They start at the top, there's probably a CEO there somewhere, and then they start uh, drawing and drawing downwards. And probably most of you are here, right? Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. And then they say, oh, by the way, there are also informal networks in the organization. Yes, it is true that, that people communicate with each other through the, through the network. Uh, well, hierarchies are not bad. There's actually, they are, they are useful. Uh, Donella Meadows is a systems thinker, and she said, uh, hierarchies reduce the amount of information that we have to keep track of. That is, for example, why we talk about five people as a team, and the team has a name that makes it easier for us to talk about those five people. Uh, so abstraction and hierarchies have, have a function. But they are often abused. They are badly, badly applied. Because if we really look at nature, what we see everywhere are networks. Networks are more natural than, than hierarchies. This is how things grow, said, uh, said Fritjof Capra. Everywhere there are networks. And Gary Hamill said the same thing. Human beings have a new way of organizing themselves. And uh, the, the, the network is an alternative to the hierarchy. So I would prefer to see the organization like this. This is the organization. It is a network of people working together. And oh, by the way, some parts of it are probably hierarchies. That is useful sometimes, to have some hierarchies somewhere that enables us to, to abstract uh, away from, from things, uh, to make it easier to, for us to talk about teams and, and, and groups. So that is what an organization is. Now what is a, a corporation? What makes an organization something that we call corporate? That's an interesting question. Well, here's what the dictionary says. Uh, as a body formed and authorized by law. Aha, uh -huh, interesting. Law is important here. Where, uh, where this corporation is, is, is behaving as if it is a person and, and endowed with rights and duties. So according to a law, a corporation is a person. It can be punished according to law. It can, it can have properties uh, and it can have rights and, and, and duties. That makes an organization a corporation. Now what usually happens is what people do is that the corporation owns the community. The corporation comes first, and then everything inside is owned by the corporation. And we hear that in phrases such as, um, our, our people 
are our most important assets. I hate that. I hate that expression. It is as if the corporation owns the people. Well, that's not true. Nobody can own me, so I cannot be an asset on a balance sheet of, of a corporation. Right? So I don't like that expression. Uh, I, it, it is well meant. People mean that they try to appreciate people, but the language, I think, is, is wrong. So the corporation does not own the community. What, what I prefer is that the corporation serves the community. It is like a platform. It should be offering services to, to, that, uh, to that community. I find that more interesting. So, and when we have this corporation, where do we put it? Do we put it here, or 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 here? That's an interesting question. Where do we put the corporation? Well, why don't we put it everywhere? Why, why should a corporation be somewhere in, uh, in, in the world? Why can, it, why can it not be anywhere? It, because we're, we're after networks, uh, after all. So when I think about organizations and corporations, then I have this conclusion for businesses in the 21st century. I like to see businesses as networks of, of legal entities offering services. So legal entities are, 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 are is, is, is what is necessary according to law. You need to be registered with a government and then you are a corporation. But I would prefer, prefer to do that everywhere in the world. I don't care if it is in Sao Paulo or the Netherlands or whatever, everything has its benefits and drawbacks. So I would see them as networks of legal things that offer services to the, to the community. We're going to see an example later on. First, I'm going to talk about management. Do we need management? Do we need management, anyone? Yes? No? Mm, I see some people nodding their heads a little bit. Mm. Maybe some uh, tried, would love to shake their heads, but I'm not sure. Uh, do we need management? There's another model. It also has five levels. Isn't that amazing? Again, five levels. It's like a law that all models have to have five levels. So this is from a book, Good to Great. And it says uh, that it's, it starts with seeing people as individuals, and then we see each other as team members, and then we become managers. Ooh. And then beyond managers, we become leaders, that's even more important. And then if you really, really made it, you are the executive. I hate this model. I hate it. Because it, it's, it pretends that being a leader is, is more important than being a manager. I think that's nonsense. I think it's nonsense. And being the executive is the most important thing at all that you can achieve. Wah, bleh. No, 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 no. I don't agree with that. I think, it is, I think it is different. I agree with this guy, Ralph Stacey. Uh, he is a complexity researcher. And he says this distinction between managers and, and leaders, it is, uh, it is an idealization. Uh, and uh, it, is, it is very fashionable nowadays to replace the word management with leader. We, you see it on some websites of, of big businesses where, where it, one of the menus says, our leadership team. What they mean is just the management team, but they did a search and replace on all the words managers and then place it, replace it with leaders. I think it's a bit nonsense. I see it as this. Uh, I see it as leadership and governance. Leadership is important, like the, the, the conference organizers, they are leaders. They, 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 they have, have been able to invite 400 people and, uh, and get them to this conference. People, you all of here are, I assume, voluntary, voluntarily. Right? Nobody was forced to be here, I hope. So that makes the conference organizers leaders. They were able to get volunteers to this, uh, to this room. But at the same time, they're also governors. There are some rules. There are some rules for people. This is typical what governors do. They decide this is what you can do, this is what you cannot do. I'm sure you have to pay at some point. Right? That's a rule. So leadership and governance are two aspects of what I call management. Management is leadership on the one hand and governance on the other hand. And um, uh, it is very important because 
not knowing how to manage is the single largest reason for business failure, said Peter Drucker, one of the greatest management gurus of the last century. Not knowing how to manage is the, the biggest reason for failure. Um, and uh, Mike Rother has this very interesting uh, definition. He says, my definition of management, I'm going to read it out loud, is the systematic pursuit of desired conditions by utilizing human capabilities in a concerted way. Isn't that beautiful? It sounds like poetry. <laughs> I don't like poetry. I never understand poetry. But, but he means it well. He means it well. So uh, management, management is important. And what I, uh, I, uh, uh, what I return to is this, is this picture of this community, of this, of this tribe. This is a community with, a, with a, a geographical boundary. It's a country. Right? What is a country? A country is people living together and there is a boundary around it and we protect that, uh, we protect that boundary. This is a picture of a business. It's people living together, or virtually living together, doing things together, and there's a boundary around it, but an economical boundary in this case. Instead of a geographical boundary, we have an economical boundary. So for me, running a country is very much the same as running a business. There are communities of people doing things together, and, and we have to protect that, that boundary, that identity. So management is, for me, very much the same as what government is doing in, in, in a country. There's very many, many parallels. Now, who appoints management? Who says, these people will manage the business? Who, happen, well, who are the people in a country? Well, usually they are uh, 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 elected in a democratic way, right? In countries, they are elected in a democratic way. But it, does this happen in businesses? No, usually not. Usually what happens is that managers serve the stockholders. So there are many people represented in the business, but one of them is the most important and they are the shareholders of the company. And managers mainly listen to them. Because indirectly the shareholders through a board usually assign uh, and, and, and position the managers. I think that's not good. And John Mackey agrees. Uh, uh, but he said, and he had a good point, those shareholders, they are paid last, after everyone else. So first the customers are being paid, and the employees are being paid, and everyone else is being paid, and if there is some money left, then at the end, the stockholders also get a bit of money. So he said, that is a reason why managers uh, make sure that the stockholders are uh, uh, are satisfied. That's a, that's, a, that's a good thing. But at the same time, if you serve one group at the expense of others, that always leads to failure. It leads to distrust and the risk of sustainability of the firm. Said, um, what's his name? Robert Hurley, with a great book about, about trust. So he said, it always goes wrong if you have a community of people working together and you serve only one group or you listen to only one group, that will go wrong. Whatever you do, it just always goes wrong. We have to listen to everyone. And, uh, and Russell Eckhoff, a system thinker, said uh, practically the same thing. A corporation that fails itself, fails to see itself as an instrument of all its stakeholders will fail. So he said basically managers have to listen to the employees and the customers and the suppliers and the stockholders, everyone. It is like managing a family with, with many children. And you don't favor just one. No, you have to manage everyone and keep everyone happy at the same time. That's difficult. But hey, nobody said it would be easy. Ricardo Samuel said uh, something similar. Uh, the way to, uh, we need a new way to determine when a company is doing well. I said one sensible approach is to ask stockholders and employees and clients and suppliers and the community uh, where the business is, is located. We listen to everyone, is what uh, Samuel says. And that's a good thing. So, this is for me the ideal. When this manager 
or this governor listens to all the stakeholders, but he has a special ear for the shareholders because he realizes the shareholders are always last in line. They only get money when everyone else was paid first. So he really has to take that into account. Now, how do we, uh, how do we make sure that management happens well in a country? What, what defines uh, government, government in a country? Well, usually there are constitutions. Most countries in the world have constitutions that describes how the country is managed with a parliament or a senate or a house or president or prime minister, whatever. All kinds of variations, but usually there is a, a constitution, a document. So I think, why don't we have that in, in businesses as well? Why don't we have a document that describes how the business is managed? So my conclusion from these questions, if I think about businesses in the 21st century, I think ideally those businesses should have constituted management, so management based on a document that describes this is how we manage the business, and they should, uh, uh, they should listen to all the stakeholders. So management for all the stakeholders and not just the, the shareholders. All right, let's talk about success. How do organizations survive? Interesting question. What makes organizations survive? I like, some of you might know that I like complexity science and systems thinking. I draw all kinds of inspiration from, uh, from science. And one of the concepts in, in, in systems thinking and, and, and science is that of the fitness landscape. It is a metaphor. It is a metaphor that says, uh, if this is your organization, then you try to achieve the highest possible peak in the fitness landscape. This means the best performance that is possible in the current environment. That is what the fitness landscape means. And of course, you try to get there. You try to get there at that peak. But this is difficult because basically you do not know what the landscape looks like. It is like walking blindly and finding, finding the highest peaks. That is what we're doing, actually, as, as businesses. And one problem is that many times businesses get stuck on a local peak. They have good performance, but they could have better performance if they radically changed to somewhere else. But that's difficult, a radical, radical change. Because if you only do step-by-step -step improvements, things have to get worse before they get better. You know? So for, the, for those of you who like lean uh, thinking, this is uh, the difference between continuous improvement and, and radical, uh, radical change, radical improvement. So we travel across the fitness landscape as businesses. And uh, Peter Drucker said, in order to do that, every organization has to be a change agent. The most effective way to manage change, he said, is to create it. We should not resp just respond to change, we have to create change. And this is also what the, the scientists say. This fitness landscape, it is not static. It changes all the time. And actually, the landscape is, is like made of rubber. Every step that we make is, is influencing the landscape itself. So it is having an effect. So the way we walk across the landscape is changing the landscape itself we are actively manipulating uh, the, the, our environment by acting on it. So that's what Drucker said. We have to be change agents, actively create the change. All right, that's interesting, I think. Eric Ries of the Lean Startup book, very popular nowadays, he said, I believe that learning is the essential unit of progress. So that is how we travel across the fitness landscape and become better as businesses, by learning all the time. How do we do that? Well, there's a very famous uh, concept of the learning organizations nowadays. Learning is crucial. That's why Alexander Magno is fo focusing on learning 3.0. Great ideas he has, uh, he has there. So organizations should be learning all the time. And uh, uh, 
getting from here to there, so from this place on the fitness landscape to over there, it requires change that is transformational and creative. So we have to transform ourselves and the environment and be creative. The creative economy is, is, is a word that keeps popping up in this last uh, couple of years. Some people say that this is the third form of an economy that we are now entering in. Like the first was the industrial economy, and then the second was the, the, the information or knowledge economy in the, in, in the last part of the last century. And now we're turning into the creative economy, where everything is, is about creation and innovation. So then my question becomes, all right, now I know how to survive. I survive by, by creating things and by learning all the time. How do we do that? How do we do that? Well, here's a, here's a model that I created recently. This is my own model. I'm very proud of it. It does not have five levels, by the way. So maybe I should improve it. But this, is, this model says, sometimes we have good practices. The practices are on this side. So here are, here are good practices. Like, for example, I have, this, I have this timer here. You see? This is my timer. It says how many minutes I am, uh, I am speaking already. That's 31 minutes. All right, I'm doing well. So this is a practice. This is a good practice. I know as a speaker that it's useful to have my timer there because I, I, sh I should never rely on clocks or ever anything else that is, uh, uh, might, uh, might fail. So multiple, multiple timers, including the one over there. Good practice. Then there are also bad practices. Like, uh, I again left something on the plane when I, uh, uh, when I uh, emerged here, when I came here in Sao Paulo. It was unimportant. It was just a little bag with the uh, things that you get for free on the plane. But that is like the tenth time that I left something on the plane. I, I, find, I think I'm so stupid. I'm not learning there. Right? So that is this this part of the model, making mistakes. I already know I should not leave things on the plane. I don't have to learn that, I already know. So I made a mistake. Now we know that mistakes usually lead to failure. Right? And good practices, they usually lead to success. But sometimes good practices fail, sometimes. And sometimes, even with mistakes, we can be lucky. There can be a success. We might not expect it, but sometimes, even when we're doing something stupid, then, hey, whew, we got away with it. Something positive happened. The best part of this model is in the middle. This is when we run experiments. When we do something of which we do not know if it is good or if it is bad. We do it because we want to find out. That's why we call it an experiment. So. I, I, uh, a couple of uh, months ago, I ordered a chai tea latte at Starbucks. I hated it. It was terrible. I don't understand why people order chai tea lattes. They're oh. So it was an experiment. It was safe to fail. I assumed I would not die from a chai tea latte. And I only nipped a little bit and then threw it away. So that was an experiment. It was a useful experiment. Now, the science says that this is where the most learning happens. This is where we learn the most, when we run experiments. We don't learn much when we just repeat good practices, because we already know that the good practices are working. And I'm not learning much when I leave something on the plane for the tenth time. Right? I'm just being stupid. So this is where the learning takes place, in the middle, when we run experiments. So that is why Donald Reinertsen, a very, very smart uh, writer and keynote speaker, he says, we should avoid oversimplifications, like eliminate failures. No, 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 no. We should not eliminate failures. Like, we should not eliminate this part. That's not smart, because there's a lot of learning happening here. Even if we fail with experiments, we learned a lot. And he also says, we should not celebrate success. Well, if we celebrate success, we're also celebrating this part. That doesn't make sense either. He says what you should celebrate is when you run experiments and when you learn. That is the best reason to celebrate, learning. All right. So Mike Rother says uh, we have to run experiments. This fitness landscape, it is, as I said, is like walking blindly across that fitness landscape. 
So we have to run experiments. Let's see, what happens if we step here? Oh, that's, that feels safe. All right. What happens if we step here? Oh, oh, I feel something here. So this is, this is what, a fit, what walking across a fitness landscape is for an organization. Walking blindly, but running safe experiments. And this is my fourth conclusion, uh, the fourth principle for tribal businesses. Support learning by running experiments. All right, let us summarize. The first principle was that I see organizations as communities. Communities of stakeholders with a purpose. We are there together to, war, to making life better for ourselves and for other people. That should be the purpose of the, of the business. And we are communities of people working together. The second principle is that, that this, these corporations, these legal entities, they should serve the stakeholders. We do not own the people. We do not own the community. We serve them by making things, uh, services available, like property rights and, and protection from, from, from law, etc., etc. The third principle is constituted management. This community has to be managed, like countries have to be managed. Uh, we have already proven that countries without government usually fail. They are anarchies, very bad examples we have of that. So we need a little bit of, uh, of management in business as well. And the fourth principle is we have to support learning. If that organization wants to survive, we have to learn all the time by running experiments. So those are, for me, the four principles for tribal businesses. Now let us talk about happiness. This guy is a, is a, a guru on the, on, on the topic of, of happiness. And he said a couple of interesting things. He said, Pleasure comes more from making progress towards the goal than from achieving them. That is interesting. So what makes people happy? Well, interestingly enough, it is not achieving something itself that makes people happy. Because there's only short-term uh, happiness and then the next day we might be unhappy again. Because what else is there to achieve? He says what makes people happy is the road that we're traveling towards progress, the, the idea that today we can do more than yesterday, and tomorrow we can do even more. Though this progress is apparently what, uh, what Jonathan Haidt said is what, make it, is what making us happy. And I found something else that is interesting. Uh, many people say uh, that happy workers create uh, a better performance in business. That's true. That's true. So happy people, happy workers in, in business have better performance uh, in the organization. But the reverse effect is stronger. So if an organization has good performance, it makes people happier. So if your organization is doing well, as a result, people become happier because they're making progress. And progress is what's making people happy. So usually people have it the wrong way around. As Phil Rosenzweig said, does employee satisfaction lead to high performance? Probably, probably. But usually the reverse is stronger. The high performance of a business leads to happy people. So my conclusion is if we want workers in the world to be happier in their jobs, we should not just make people happy. Hey, that's easy. Just throw a party. Ta-da, done. That's not working in the long term. No, what, what we should be doing is help organizations perform better. Because if those organizations perform better, the side effect will be that people will become happier because we're making progress. So I'm going to tell you for the last five minutes about my own experiment, or last 10 minutes. This is Melly. Melly is hating her job. Melly, Melly doesn't like her job. This is a, a picture that is in my hometown in Rotterdam, in the Netherlands, uh, in one of the uh, busiest shopping streets, and it's been there for 20 years. For 20 years, Melly Shum has been hating her job. And for a long time, I have been wondering, why? Why is Melly hating her job? Why doesn't she quit? Why doesn't she go somewhere else where it's more fun? where there's a, a better business environment. But no, she just sits there, 
typing, hating her job. I know some people like that. One of my best friends, she works for the government and she hates her job, but she doesn't quit because she has a mortgage to pay and all kinds of other excuses and, and reasons for staying in her job, hating it every day. And I think that's sad. I want to do something about that. I would like to help her. So what I tried to do with some other people is we came up with a business. We call it Happy Melly. We want Melly to be happy. And the purpose of the organization, the purpose is uh, to create happy workers, but we understand that the solution is not throwing a party. No, no, no. The solution is helping businesses perform better, because then the side effect will be happier workers. So that is why we have this, this cool logo of Happy Melly. And the Happy Melly tries to satisfy all those ideas that, of, of tribal businesses that I just talked about. So for example, the first principle. It is a community of stakeholders with a purpose. The purpose is workers should be happier in their jobs. That is what we're going to do. That, what, that is what the purpose of our business, to help other organizations, the people working there, to be happier. And the stakeholders is these. Many people involved. Here you see Andre. And uh, here's me. And uh, here are some freelancers who created animations for us. And there are some licensed facilitators over there of Management 3.0. And many people involved. Because Management 3.0 is now owned by Happy Melly. So those are all the people. Uh, involved at this time. So it's a community. It's a community of people working together with a purpose. The second principle is it should be a network of legal entities supporting people, uh, offering services. Well, we have a Happy Melly in Brazil. Ta da! Yay! Happy Melly in Sao Paulo. We also have a Happy Melly in Australia. And we also have a Happy Melly in Canada. And three in Europe in Sweden and in the Netherlands and Switzerland and more are on their way. It is a network. It's a network of corporations living together. They're having a party next door. <laughs> I'm sure they're now much happier over there than over here in this room. <laughs> Can someone please do something about the sound over there? Because it's a bit disturbing. All right. I should go next door and join the party, I think. <laughs> so the third, uh, third principle. Constituted management. Constituted management for all stakeholders. So the managers, there are a couple of managers. I am the CEO. I am the, the chief ecosystem officer, as I call myself. I'm not a chief executive officer, I'm a chief ecosystem officer. I take care of the ecosystem. And we have a constitution. It's a document, you can actually download it, and it says how we do our business and it says, for example, that the CEO, that is me, is, is, uh, is elected. So the, everyone involved, the stakeholders and the legal entities, they vote. And they can do that any time. In theory, they could have a Skype call right now and vote me out. Ooh, that's dangerous. <laughs> so I better keep the trust of the whole community. Because any day, any day during the year, they can say, Jürgen is not a good, doing a good job anymore. All right, here he goes, and we'll choose someone else. I think that is very healthy. I think it's very healthy for a president of a country or a prime minister or a CEO of a company to keep the trust every day. Otherwise, there you go, and they vote for somebody else. And last one is, uh, last principle is experiments. Learning through experiments. We actually have a uh, a Trello board that lists all the experiments that we're running. So we have, uh, we have conferences coming up. The announcement will be next week. Uh, the week afterwards, we're going to announce publishing, global publishing of books, etc. And many more experiments that we're running. And I expect some of those to fail. I hope that 50% of those will fail. Because ev if everything is succeeding, then we're probably not learning fast enough. Right? So. Oh, I hope half of them will fail and half of them will be a success. That means that we have a good, optimal learning rate. So let us wrap up. Let us wrap up. I think tribal businesses are communities of stakeholders with a purpose. I find that important. As soon as you use the metaphor of communities 
for businesses, you come to very different conclusions on how you need to manage those businesses. They are basically volunteers. They're people. They can walk out any time they want and go somewhere else where it's more enjoyable. And some people fortunately do. There should be networks, not hierarchies, networks of legal entities. And they should not own the community, they should serve the community by making services available, like property rights and, and all that other legal, legal stuff has to be taken care of. Management should be constituted. I think more and more businesses, and I have seen a couple of them, will start to document how their organizations are managed. With just a couple of pages, like a constitution. You can call it a constitution or not, but I, I've seen some other businesses as well that have constitutions. It describes how the business is managed. And then they can become democracies uh, for all the stakeholders involved. And last one, we should support learning by doing endless experiments. Uh, and uh, sometimes people ask me, how can you describe Happy Melly in a short, in, in, in a simple way? And then I, I, I learned that the best way to describe it is, uh, it is a, a cooperation of multiple entrepreneurs working together. It is a franchise because we license our brands and it is an incubator because we experiment with startups. It's all of that uh, together. Cooperation, franchise, incubator. So the experiments are an essential part of what we're doing. All right, that's it. That is how I see how I think more and more businesses in the 21st century will, will evolve as tribal businesses. For some, it will be totally different from what has been happening in the, in the last 100 years. But for others, like Semco or Virgin or Southwest Airlines, this makes total sense. It is just the next step on the road to better, better organizations. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, thank you. And I was about to say, don't forget uh, the little cars in the back. The red ones mean, I like tomato juice. The yellow ones mean, I love lemonade. And the green one means, I like caipirinha. All right? All right. Thank you. Nós temos tempo para pergunta. Quem quer se habilita aí? Quem quer conversar um pouco? Uh, do, we have, do we have some time to... Uh, yeah, I was about to ask. Do we have some time for questions? Yeah, yeah. Yes. all right, good. All right. Over there. Uh, hello, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I do find it very interesting the idea of Chief Ecosystem uh, Officer. O officer, yeah. Uh, it's interesting the idea that it's similar to a democracy. Uh, I do, it is implicit that uh, this person must be a leader, since you know must provide vision yep. and, and encourage others to to work uh, willingly towards any any cause. But this doesn't it bring a, a little bit of the problem that the democracies have? You know, because I, I think that we have a worldwide problem of populism, which is you know yep. government should do the right thing, but. Sometimes the right thing is, is like a, a bitter medicine, you know, uh, uh, suppose you're a child doctor, you know, it, it's hard, you know, to, ha to, you need to force certain situations because that's the right thing, you know, yes. you're not doing that, you know, to punish anyone. Right. Uh, on those organizations, isn't there the risk, you know, of, you know, uh, electing officials we, which are just popular guys who are saying things that, nice things that people yep. want to hear? Very good question, very good question. Thanks for raising it. Uh, I agree. Uh, and I like, uh, the, uh, I like the quote by Winston Churchill. He said uh, something like, uh, democracies are, are, are bad, but all the other systems are even worse. Right? So yes, it is not ideal to have people vote uh, on things. I sometimes say that democracy is two wolves and one sheep voting on what's for dinner. Because usually minorities get screwed in, in, in democracies, and, and that's, that's a fact of life. But I do believe that smart people can do things in, in a better way. Like one of my favorite examples is uh, Jeff Bezos of Amazon. 
uh, he he basically says to to his shareholders, uh, uh, "Screw you guys." Because I am in it for the long run. He only does things for the long term. Never, never does he do anything just to raise the stock for the, the next three quarter uh, uh, or three month earnings, or quarterly earnings. And sometimes the shareholders grumble a bit, but his performance is magnificent at Amazon. So he proves that if you stop focusing on the short term and just only focus on the long term with your business, the value of the company will just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And who can complain about that? Only the competitors, right? So I think it is the same for a dem democratic leader. I think uh, the system that many countries have, that you have elections every four years or every five years, is itself a bad system. Because this creates the implicit incentive that those people focus on the next term, right? Uh, because they want to be re-elected. Re so I am being re-elected re re every day, basically, because they can vote me out any day. That means I basically can stop focusing on the short term because the short term is just now. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. For me, the only alternative is the long term. So I don't have to think about the next election in the next couple of years because there isn't any. Uh, I think that that can help me to focus on the long term and instead of the short term. But it is an experiment, I admit. The way we run our business, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I hope it turns out for the better. <laughs> Good question, thanks. Next, uh, all right, thanks. The last question, sorry. Hi, Jürgen. Hey. Uh, well, you have talked about work and relationships and communities. And I think what's pretty interesting, you haven't mentioned money at any time. So uh, I think it's pretty clear for us that money don't make people happy. I mean, people need purpose and et cetera. But I'd like to know where does money get in on your perception of a, of a, a, a corporation? So. All right. Thank you. Very good question. The great questions these audience, this audience has. Awesome. So um, I have been uh, the co-founder of Agile in Europe community, which is a community of volunteers of Agile um, uh, people in, in, in Europe. I have been the co-founder of Stoes Network, uh, together with Steve Denning and, and Peter Stevens and uh, Franz Rosli. Uh, again, these were volunteers. And after doing this a couple of times, I realized that it is very, very hard to motivate people if, if it's only about getting volunteers together and try to change the world. Uh, basically, what usually happens is you draw a lot of consultants, and the consultants start beaming PowerPoints at each other, trying to sell each other uh, uh, their own services. Right? So uh, I, I realized that um, maybe I should add money to the equation. Maybe I should run a business myself. So that is why I stopped focusing on, on the volunteer networks. I hope they do a great job with the Stoes Network and Agile in Europe, but I did my thing. So I, I have finished. I hope the others take over, and they do. But I now focus on Happy Melly. It is a business. We make money. That is one of the things that we have to do. We have to make money. But I agree with Peter Drucker, who said, money for an organization is like oxygen for the human being. If we don't have it, we die. But the purpose for us is not to breathe. <laughs> that, is, that, that doesn't make sense. We have something bigger than that. For organizations, it's the same thing. Our purpose as Happy Melly is to try and help others be happy in their jobs. This requires money. And this requires us having a profit, because the stockholders also need to be happy. They're one of the many stakeholders. So this is where money comes in, and it adds uh, interesting dynamics. Like, we have to pay ourselves. Uh, I have a management team uh, of, of, uh, of uh, six people, and we pay ourselves a little bit. But then the question is, okay, how much do we get? <laughs> and uh, can we do this in a more modern way? So, for example, we introduce the merit system. We basically vote on how much the others in the management team are getting. So each of the, the, the membership, membership, the management team members has, uh, has 100 points per month, and we assign those points to others, like 20 points for you, 15 points for you, 25 points for you, etc. And then we add all the points, and then we convert it to euros. And this is the money that you earn. 
So the result is we have to do well in the eyes of the other team members because the other team members vote on my salary and all of us do that. So this makes it interesting because we have a business and we have money so we have to think about the money as well. But the money is an enabler. It is not the, the purpose to make money but it, it, it is like oxygen. We need it. And I think that will help us be more successful than networks of volunteers because as businesses, I think we can make more of an impact in what is happening in the world. Thanks for the question. Thank you, everyone. If you have more questions, feel free to ask me in the one of the breaks. Thanks. And enjoy.